Hi, everybody. Welcome to Equalex's uh, Facebook Live today. We've got a very, very special guest today who um, is absolutely incredible in terms of the um, divorce coaching sphere and more. Deborah Doc, I would like... Uh, welcome. Welcome. Hey, thanks. I'm excited to be here. Well, so yes, we had we had a few issues with the with the time zones, and but we've got right. here, so I'm really delighted to to have you here. Now, I'm just going to read off a bit about you. Okay, you've got so many certifications, and you've had so much experience um, in terms of what you do. You've got your you've got your hand in many pies, haven't you? Mm -hmm. You do lots of different things. So you're a I CEC certified divorce coach. Yeah. You're a I certified divorce financial um, anal analyst. Mm -hmm. You're a Ohio Supreme Court trained family and divorce mediator. You're a DCA pre, -medi uh, pre mediation divorce coach. You're a um, DCA divorce conflict coach. You're a member of the ABA dispute resolution section. You continue to pursue um, education and betrayal, uh, trauma, and intimate partner abuse. Mm -hmm. What I really love about what you say is that you're committed to saving marriages uh, where possible because absolutely, you know, we are not pro-divorce in this, in this right. space. And yeah. how I met you is the wonderful work you do as a founder of the Divorce Coaches Academy and, um, and you teach and train and mentor other professional divorce coaches yeah. on an international basis, don't you? Yeah, Absolutely. That's really and one of my favorite things to do is mentor and train new divorce coaches. Absolutely. Yeah. And you're brilliant and you're brilliant, brilliant at it. Aww. I um I was really um interested in your little quote, which so many people can relate to going through this process or thinking about this process. And that was I stayed too long because I was afraid. So tell me right. more about tell you more about that. Yeah. Well, first of all, it's great to have all those certifications, right? But what the one thing I wish I could do was convert international time. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm, Bridget, Bridget texts me and says, Hey, I'm on the live. And I said, Hey, I'm out walking the dog. I don't even have any makeup on. So um, let me hop on. Because I thought it was an hour from now. So I just <laughs> Yeah, well, we're so delighted. We we're really delighted to have you on. <laughs> so, just because you have a bunch of training doesn't mean you can do practical things, and we're okay with that. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think that that is not uncommon for people to stay too long because they're afraid. And what do those fears sound like? You know, fear I think does two things. It keeps people stuck. And then once they do decide to leave, it can make their divorce harder and more expensive than it needs to be. So fears that keep people stuck, money, kids, and conflict. Mm. Am I going to have enough to live on, right? Um, or is he hiding money? How, how is this all going to work money-wise? And then kids, we hear that all the time, right? I stayed for the kids. I'm afraid the impact divorce is going to have on my kids. And then conflict. Um, I'm afraid he's going to go crazy when I tell him this, that mm. I'm going to leave and I don't know how I'm going to handle that. So those are the big fears that I hear that really uh, makes it hard for people to make that decision. Absolutely. Do you work with predominantly women or do you work with men as well? I do have a few male clients, but I would say I predominantly work with women. Um, I think as a, as a rule, Women are more likely to reach out for support. Yeah, um, and I saw it, I saw a quote, another quote, um, that talked about you being a champion of women in the U.S. I am a champion of women. Um, I think, you know, one of the things I specialize is in betrayal trauma, um, and I work a lot with women on setting boundaries, using that assertive language. And that's where, you know, I think sometimes we can save marriages. If mm -hmm. women have been passive or they haven't spoken up and they've built up that resentment, right? So sometimes going back and, and rewriting the marriage contract, right? Like, mm -hmm. I know, honey, I've been giving in a lot and I've been quiet and I haven't been asserting myself. And so that's making me really unhappy. 
And so I'm going to show up differently and we're going to see if that makes a difference. Yeah, absolutely. I've done a lot of speaking engagements over the last couple of months because there has been a focus on women in finance. And Mm -hmm. um, we we have a document, 50 plus questions that you actually need to ask each other before you take that commitment to be with each other. Are you a spender? Are you a saver? What sort of parenting style are you? You know, if you've already got children or are we going to have kids? All of that, all of that across sort of all spheres of of your life. It's really important to have that conversation. Right. Do you think all of our funds ought to be joint or should each of us have a little separate account where there's money that we don't have to account for? That's a a big thing, right? Yeah. And, 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 and what about me having time off? Um, Am I allowed to have, you know, are we going to agree that I will have time off when we had children? Mm Mm-hmm. Right. All of, all of that. Right. So yeah. very interesting. You just, you just brought up a trigger phrase for me, which is, am I allowed? You know, and I, I hear that sometimes from women, like, well, let me check with my husband and see if I can. That's right. And That's I right. say, no, what? I don't say no, right? We don't tell clients what to do. And I say, but I ask them, what do you think would happen if instead you went to him and said, is there any reason why I shouldn't? Mm. I hear that often right. too. Right. So I'm going in with the assumption that I'm an adult and I'm allowed to make choices about what I do. And the only reason I wouldn't be doing this is if you have a prior commitment or there's a reason. Mm. Right. Mm. But I'm a grown up. If I want to go have dinner and drinks with my girlfriends on Thursday. I see it a lot. I even. Yeah. And you would get it, too, in terms of I'm just going to check with my ex-husband whether I can actually do the divorce coaching. Hmm. Right. Yeah. Get get a, get a lot of that as well. The other thing mm-hmm. is, that I'm interested in your perspective, but I think people generally need to have a potential discussion around the future, just in case. Obviously, nothing's guaranteed. Of uh, if they are going to separate, what that looks like for them in the future when they're in a good space, when they're in a positive, happy space. What are your thoughts on that? Sure. And I think as people are getting older, when they get married, we really ought to be talking about prenups. Mm. Mm. You know, prenuptial agreements. Um, As a financial professional involved in the divorce world, one of the things that I see causes a lot of angst, where we have to get forensic accountants and CPAs and some of these expensive professionals involved is separating out What's marital from separate property, right? And people arguing over that. If we talked about that before we got married, what's your 401k? What is your property that you got from grandma? And we made intentional decisions about how to keep it separate or what we were merging. We wouldn't have that trouble when we broke up. Mm, mm, We spent mm. a lot of time fighting over what's this and what's that. Mm. And it's interesting, I saw a stat recently that in the US, separation, divorce, what's happening in New Zealand, less people are getting married, more in de facto relationships. But it's approaching 67% of people separating in the US. Mm. And I haven't seen that one, but I wouldn't be surprised. Mm. So that's nearly two thirds of relationships um, right. ending. And as we all know, during the last two to three years with the COVID period, um, it's yeah. definitely escalated over that time. Well, it really has. Mm. You know, people were able to distract themselves. Stay busy. Go to the gym. Stay at work later. Just stay real busy with the kids. Stay out of the house. Um, and when we were in lockdown, they were like, wow. Now that I'm spending all this time with you, I'm realizing I actually don't care for you that much. You're kind of annoying. We actually don't really get along or share a lot of values or whatever it is they were avoiding. Hey, right. expectations. They were, they were, yeah, they were avoiding and in denial about the problems that were there, but they were able to avoid it with busyness. Mm-hmm. And COVID kind of brought that to a halt. Um, but you know what? What's going on with the with the separation rate and the divorce rate? I'm not one that's here to judge. You know, Mm. I've been divorced twice. You know, I don't, I don't shame myself for that. 
Um, I made some bad choices. It was better in both cases. We're all happier, all of us, because yeah. of that. Um, and and you said that, um, obviously I'm seen a quote from you, that um, you said that you've made your own divorce harder and more expensive. I mm. did. I made my, my second one a lot harder and more expensive than it needed to be because I didn't, <coughs> pardon me, my first divorce, we didn't have anything. The kids were babies. He gave me full custody. We shared a moving van. <laughs> we moved to our new places. That was that. Um, there was nothing to fight over. So I didn't really understand divorce. The second one, not so much. And I was financially dependent by then. I wasn't financially dependent the first time. We made the same money. So there was nothing to do or split up. Um, but I was financially dependent. So I got stuck in that fear of scarcity. Is there going to be enough? Am I going to be able to live? I was afraid he was hiding money. I was dealing I was with betrayal with traumas. Mm. Pardon? Mm. Right there with yeah. you on that one. Mm. A supplementary so, credit yeah. card. Mm. Yeah. So um, my amygdala was on like full blast. Mm. I was mm. just having a big trauma response. And I just thought you go to an attorney. Well, that's not always the most helpful. If I had had somebody like a divorce coach to say to me, let's talk about, let me, let me help you understand what the process is. Let me help you talk through your story. Let me help you separate the story from the business of divorce. Um, mm. I think it would have been, so it would have gone a lot it. better. Yeah. Yeah, let's yeah, talk about absolutely. that, right? Um, you know, do you find that your clients what? have that experience? You know, mm. that you end up saving them a lot of heartache and stress and money because they work with you? Oh, you know what? What is really wonderful, and I'm sure you've found the same, Deborah, is I'm really encouraged by the number of amicable couples who are coming to us now. Mm -hmm. Um, and they either come together or we see one, and then we, and nine times out of ten, we're able to engage the other partner. And mm -hmm. you can see from that first meeting over those few months that we work with them, the changes, the positive changes in their body language and their tone right. with each other, and and obviously teaching them in terms of the conflict coaching how to communicate effectively, assertively rather yeah. than passively or aggressively, as you as you mentioned. And um, taking them through uh, what actually triggers each other, you know, emotionally. Right. What are those, as you said, what are those phrases and words that that trigger them? And, you know, for us, it's really helping them separate with dignity. And nothing's better. And I'm sure you're the same. Sometimes I need to, yeah. a lot of times actually, I go to the corner of my office and I have a wee cry because we've got such great outcomes for our clients. <laughs> you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. It just makes such a difference. The, the other way I think it makes a difference is if, if we can get a little time with a client before they talk to their spouse, before they make that announcement conversation, mm -hmm. how they start the divorce process mm -hmm. has such a big influence on how mm -hmm. it goes. And so to be able to have that initial conversation in a kind and respectful way without rushing into things, without trying to do premature negotiation and just giving people time and space and kindness to get to the same point you are. And it makes such a difference if we can be with them before. I can't tell you how many clients I have prepped for that conversation and they come yeah. back and say, oh, that went so much better than I expected. Yeah. I know. With this group, with all the pointers that they need to think about, and there's a real sense of relief. And as you say, it sets the scene for the whole process. You know, that yeah. first conversation um, in terms of that conversation, that script with their partner, um, mm -hmm. and it's not a lawyer and getting a letter being sent straight away because, as you and I know, the letter writing right. between lawyers, that's the start of the end, isn't it? Yeah, it is. If the very first thing you do is serve papers, you know, mm. in the U.S., you, you file and then somebody gets served, what, at mm. their work, at their mm. soccer game, mm. like in front of people and you embarrass them and humiliate them, 
yeah. by serving them with divorce papers, unless there's a safety reason to do that, that's, that's just going to start it off in a way that isn't going to go well. So we need yes. to talk through, right? Mm. The particularly the cons of doing that. Yeah. And particularly if they're not the initiator, because we talk about the grief process and if you, it's, mm -hmm. a, if it's not mutual, there is a real difference. And I like it to a running race. You know, if you're the initiator, you've run that race, you're across the finish line and the, yeah. and the person who didn't initiate that is right at the start. So the grief of, the mm -hmm. anger, you know, you could, you cannot negotiate with someone who's angry. You know? Right. You cannot. And that's, you know, one of the courses I just taught a few months ago at Divorce Coaches Academy, teaching uh, divorce coaches how to coach their clients through this conversation is mm -hmm. I, I really say it's not even a conversation. It's an announcement. This should take yeah. less than five minutes, really, because you're not doing negotiation. You're not getting back on the hamster wheel of defending why you're making the decision you are. You've done that already. Mm -hmm. Right. It's a firm whatever you can do that's whatever you can say that's nice um you've been a great provider thank you for giving us the opportunity to travel around the world I love how you are the kids soccer coach and you're so encouraging and mentoring to them whatever it is you can say and then the announcement of you affirm you announce right I've made this decision not because no blaming statements nothing to put them in a defensive state of mind I have decided this for me, mm. that mm. I'm going to move forward with divorce. Mm. Then your spouse is going to have a reaction and you acknowledge it. I hear and, that you're and, angry. I hear that you're sad. It's not the outcome I wanted either. I just dropped a bomb on you. Let's take a few days to process this. And that's it's, it. Absolutely. I totally agree. I say to clients, um, write down five positive things about your partner. Mm -hmm. Put them somewhere so you, you you can remember those. Or yeah. always when you're communicating, they've got to be at the forefront of, of your communication with your ex-spouse. Mm -hmm. This leads me to to divorce. I'm I'm actually not re I'm you know I'm going everywhere with these. I'm not sticking to the questions, but this is great. Um, divorce disclosure, and that's really interesting. You know, we you 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 um you teach about this, and children really want both parents to be present at that conversation. So by divorce disclosure, it's the time that the children are told about the divorce or separation. And mm -hmm. honest and open communication is really important, isn't it? It's a, it's so pertinent that couples are on the same page. And you and I both coach clients on how to have that conversation and what that looks like. And what that looks like. And I think it's so important to tell your children, even if you don't know all the details, right? Sometimes people will say, well, we haven't made a decision about who's keeping the house or who's leaving where. And so we don't want to tell them yet. They already know. Kids yeah. have incredible radar. And so the mm. way I kind of explain it is you're almost gaslighting them. They mm. know there's something happening, but you're not telling them. And so that's mm. creating cognitive dissonance in your kids. Mm -hmm. that they know something's up, but you're not being honest with them about it. So just start creating that place for your kids to sit in uncomfortableness. Yeah. And I you're an uncomfortable. I, yeah. Yeah. And, and you are, and your partner are really uncomfortable about it. You know, there's a lot of yeah. fear. There's a lot of, oh my God, you know, all of that right. is, and, you, and it's, and also, you know, you've got to be really definite that you are going to separate when you sit down and have that conversation. You know, you really have to, you have to do the work. You have to do the work to, to ensure that that conversation goes as smoothly as possible. And I, I, wasn't, right. I wasn't prepared with a nest egg. I didn't, um, I, um, I just left and didn't even think about getting organized for separation. Right. Didn't even cross my mind. Oh, I know. Me too. I just packed a backpack. Yeah. I tell the story of the night I took dinner out of the oven. People tell me, when, how will I know when I'm ready to go? And I say, everybody has a crystal one moment. You have a, a moment that it'll be a really small moment. You've had a bunch of big moments where he's been a jerk and it's been awful and da, 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 da. And you didn't leave then. 
there'll be a small moment where it'll be like, nope, that's it. Today's the day I know. So what we, what we want to do is work with people as soon as they start to get that feeling, that feeling that mm, I've been thinking about divorce for a while now and it's coming up for me more often. That's when we want to talk to you so that we can know, you can know on the day you take dinner out of the oven and pack your backpack and head out that it's not a panic moment. Because for me, that was a panic. Then I was like, oh, crap, what have I done? Mm -hmm. And then I started freaking out. Whereas if you've already done the work and you're prepared and you've Mm -hmm. got your exit strategy in place, then Mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if your crystalline moment is next week or six months from now. Yeah, I agree. Okay. I I just snapped. I just snapped one day. You do. And, you know, that's it. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And you've I'm got done. to. Yeah. It was, a, it was a small thing. It was absolutely minuscule compared to everything else. Mm. But it was that tiny thing. And I was like, yeah, I turned, in, I turned the oven off, took dinner out, packed the backpack, and just walked out the door. Mm, mm. And it, it, there's a big sense of relief, though, I felt that. Did you feel like that, too? Oh, uh, absolutely. Mm. But then the moment I thought about that, I was like, okay, I did that. It felt great. And now I don't have money for gas and groceries. What am I going to do? <laughs> mm. Right. Heads being prepared. And women generally leave at least a couple of years emotionally before they leave physically. I see it a lot. Do you see that, too, in right. your practice? Yeah. Oh, you know, for sure. Um, you know, and they say it takes the average uh, intimate partner violence victim seven attempts to leave. Mm. And so mm. let's an attempt to leave doesn't necessarily mean packing your bags and moving out. Mm. An attempt to leave can be this, this um, gradual distancing. It mm. might mean sleeping in a separate bedroom. It might mean not going on a family vacation or not attending his family reunion. So there are these little interim steps, I think, that are mini leavings. So absolutely, yeah. um, it takes it takes. I, th- I think it took me ten years, you know, before I actually made the decision mm-hmm. to be a long, a long process for people. And so coming back to the role of divorce coach, and a couple of sentences, yeah. Deborah. Tell us, tell us what you, your description of, of that, because people, um, particularly in New Zealand, it's very new here. Um, yeah. My business has been around for about four years or so, and so people are now getting awareness in terms of, of what we do mm-hmm. now. In, in America, it's huge, isn't it? Well, it's getting there. I mean, it's, mm. it's still relatively new. And we're still working really hard to get professional recognition. My alarm's going off to tell me it's time to start getting ready for my Facebook Live with Bridget, (laughs) by the way. (laughs) I can hear in the background. I'm starting my phone over there. What is that noise? Oh, yeah. It's time to put some some makeup on and brush my hair so that I can do a Facebook Live with Bridget. (laughs) Not so much. Um, So... So, um, yes, we have quite a few divorce coaches working, getting certified, um, doing that. But I think what we're really still, really still working on, and that's what Tracy and I are really working hard to do advocacy through Divorce Coaches Academy, is to get that professional recognition. Mm -hmm. I think attorneys, as a rule, still don't see us as professionals. Um, Some mediators still don't. So we're working really hard. Um, with some of our industry contacts to sort of get the word out because we make a difference. Every single one of my clients, every single one of your clients will say, I don't know what I would have done without you. Mm -hmm. And you would have got the same from people who have had been through divorces and separation. I've lost count. I wish I had a divorce coach when I was going through my separation. Hundreds. Me too. Me too. Me too. Yeah. Because, you know, not only just being helping with the fears, understanding the process, calming that brain down, having somebody to help you strategize, um, but reducing that conflict, that urge, you know, when we teach that conflict coaching course, I, the mantra is 
conflict is inevitable. You're going to have conflict and divorce. If the two of you got along that well, you wouldn't be getting divorced. But mm-hmm. combat is optional. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have to be combat. Yeah. You're not going to agree on everything, even in the most amicable divorce. You're, there are some things you're going to have to negotiate. But combat is optional. Yeah, absolutely. And, and for us, it's helping our clients move through to a place where they're not going to have regrets in terms of the way that they're acted. They're going to be able to look no. back in six months, a year, two years and go, God, I really mm-hmm. did act myself and in the best interests of the kids, you know? Yeah, the best interests of the kids. And, and mm-hmm. you know, I don't want anybody to be that person who you meet and they're talking about their divorce and you say, how long ago did you get divorced? And they say 10 years oh my gosh, you've been carrying that for 10 years? You still feel victimized after mm. 10 years? I'm, I am so sorry. I don't want anybody mm. to still be consumed by their divorce after 10 years. I want you to move through it and heal from it and then go have a fabulous life <laughs> is what I want. Yeah, 100%. So yeah. one of the questions that we've got here is, do I need a lawyer? You know, I would say not necessarily. Mm-hmm. In some cases, it might be worthwhile to consult with one if you have some really sticky, specific questions. So I will often work with a client in the beginning, will identify if she has specific, he or she has specific legal questions because a, a divorce coach cannot give legal advice. Mm-hmm. So if they're very specific, is this marital property or separate property? I can't answer that, right? Does, how does this judge calculate alimony or spousal support? I don't know, I can't tell you that. Um, some of the really specific things. Do they need mm. to put one on retainer and work with them throughout the whole divorce? Likely not, but maybe mm. just to get a few very specific questions answered so that mm. then when they go into a mediation or negotiation process, they feel confident and secure about what they're asking for. Yeah, absolutely. We, we, we have those conversations. And I think for us, you've got to be legally educated in the first instance about your rights, yep. obligations. Um, yep. And then I think it's prudent to get your um, settlement agreement in relation to your relationship property certified independently by lawyers, just mm-hmm. in case, because obviously there needs to be full and frank disclosure um, yep. of everything that you own and owe. And, um, you know, sometimes things happen that you don't expect for all of us in life and Mm -hmm. you know pragmatic um being prudent and getting that Mm -hmm. and getting that side I think you know is really but it doesn't have to cost thousands and thousands you know you know it doesn't um just uh, you know a couple things we recently learned found, found a statistic that said for 2022 in the U.S the family law and divorce attorney industry's revenue is expected to be $12.1 billion. That wow. is a huge amount of money that families are spending to get divorced. Yeah. And I think one of the things that happens is people just assume that's how you have to do it. Mm. And mm. yes, we need good legal advice. But the person who's in charge of your divorce is you. You are the best expert on your family, what's best for your family, what you need. And so we never want to punt responsibility to an attorney anyway. We want to use them for their legal expertise only. These are my questions, Mm. not please take over my entire life. Absolutely. And that's um, the fact that lawyers have a role, 100%. They come from a view whereas as divorce coaches as mediators we're coming from shared and common interests and that Mm -hmm. um i'm sure you're the same we have very informal mediations there's not a cast of thousands in the room and you know we have a whiteboard and we and we look at the criteria we brainstorm look at the options it's a very relaxed environment and you can see people absolutely Mm -hmm. you know relaxed going oh this is not what i thought you know it's more right. positive they can speak it's more positive we want to stay interest-based so yeah. that we can color outside the box and 
think about what's best for the family and be open and have conversations to get to that final agreement, not fight for every penny we're entitled for. And, you know, an attorney takes an oath to zealously advocate for their client. And mm. that's their role. Mm. Their, their role is to really do the best they can for their client. Yeah. And Sometimes um, the client might make a decision to take less because it's better for the family. That's yeah. okay. As long as it's yeah. an informed decision. Yeah, and I think I say to clients, you've got to think about not just about today, but about tomorrow as well, because there's no money yeah. tree out there that's going to um, that we've got growing in our backyards, you know. So, no. and that I, comes. I I did. In, what's it? I wish I did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That'd be great. And I'd be interested in your thoughts, Deborah, because in my practice. Um, 75 to 80 percent of the women that I see, I probably see 65 percent women, 35 percent men, the occasional men. But yeah, 75 to 80 percent of the women I see have absolutely no idea about their finances. They're financially illiterate. Mortgage, I'm not sure if I've got one. Um, mm -hmm. We've developed a program, a solution to that. But you know, one of the biggest things is, and actually this was one of the questions for at the end, but um, for you and I to answer, what is the biggest mistakes in divorce? And one of the biggest mistakes that I see is people not knowing what they own and owe, whether you're, regardless of your relationships. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. Or I will see women who pay the bills so his paycheck goes somewhere and then he transfers over $5,000. And so she pays the bills, but she has no idea what's in the investment account, what's in the retirement account. So she thinks they're poor. And then we go to the divorce financial disclosure process and find out they have $2.5 million mm. or that he hasn't paid taxes for seven years and they owe $2.5 million. So she thinks she knows about finances, and it turns out absolutely not. Yeah, and there's a lot I of cases. Both. Yeah, isn't there? There's definitely instances of where predominantly the wife, whoever is mm -hmm. looking after, them, uh, is busy with the kids and just sign yeah. these documents. Don't worry about why well, she's. Yeah. Uh, Don't worry. I've got it all under control. Just sign these documents. Yeah. Right. That absolutely. Seems in that quite a quite a bit um there's a question here about you know how can i afford divorce divorce coaching services how, how can, can you afford, I afford them mm -hmm. well i know you'll have a different answer than i do um a, a little bit because you you have a, an alternative that i don't offer but I'll, I'll give an example i have a lot of clients in california in california the divorce attorneys are five to six hundred dollars an hour. You can have almost six sessions with me, and I can guarantee you I will save you an hour or two with an attorney. Mm -hmm. Probably I'll save you 10 hours with an attorney, right? So, how can you afford me? Because I will save you money. Mm -hmm. You know, that's number one, depending on where you live. But if I, if even if your attorney's 250 an hour, I can guarantee you I'll save you three hours with mm -hmm. your attorney because we will process so much more. You'll be so much more organized. Instead of needing to talk with your attorney for two hours, you can do a 10 minute four bullet point email and get better information back. Mm. 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 Absolutely, 100%. I think that, um, and what I did when I went through my separation, I looked to my lawyer to get the coaching support. But of mm -hmm. course, you know, right. it, minutes and, and then you know next minute yeah. half a million dollars has gone down the tubes you know right sitting in the conference room crying oh I can 50, remember 50. I finally caught on and I would say set your timer I need one minute and for one minute I would pound the table and say this is so unfair and then I'd be like okay I'm done because I knew how much it was costing me oh, I know yeah yeah it, it, it's that realize that I know I had a fifty thousand dollar mediation that went nowhere, and I think I spent half the time crying in the toilets about it, you know. The, yeah. And um, and was going, I, you know, it just doesn't it doesn't have to be that 
that way. You know, we are what we do, it's not based on monthly billings. For us, it's about right. getting those sustainable outcomes because we have walked in everyone's shoes. Um, we have. Every day, you know? Yeah, yeah. And and I've done it both ways. I've had a really good divorce where I lived a block and a half from my co-parent. We had keys to each other's houses. We went on a five-day trip to look at colleges for our kids together. Um, we actually just moved my daughter. I'm at her place right now. We moved our daughter halfway across the U.S. together. Um, right. And then the other one, not so much. So I've got experience both ways of how beautiful co-parenting can be. And... Yeah what happens when you don't mind your emotions in a divorce where you're traumatized. Mm. So I feel like I've seen both sides and mm. I, and I know what the difference is. Would you get married again? Um, that would be a hell no ever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I agree with you. I think, but, I'm the... but you know what, as soon as you say no, you know, you know, you don't know what's going to happen, but what I will say is, I'm, I am so content with my life right now. And when my clients say, how will I know when I'm ready to date? I'm like, when you're so happy, you don't care if you ever meet anybody. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. How about you? Uh, I have been married once. Yep. And I would absolutely get married a second time. Okay. Um, but, but after that, I'd be thinking to myself, if that didn't work, I think perhaps marriage is not for me. And as right. I uh, said before, <laughs> Um, less people in New Zealand are getting married, um, more de facto. However, the Relationship Property Act applies after three years anyway. But okay. I think I wonder if you went through the same thing. I'm sure you did and lots of other people do, is that um, you come out of the relationship and if you're very vulnerable. So you end up in another relationship that's exactly the same as the one that you were in because you feel like, and this is from my perspective, I don't want to be alone at all, so I'll just settle for being in any relationship at all, mm. even if it's bad. And then as time goes on, I've been you know, separated now for nearly eight years, you get um, you get so used to being love being on your own. You've found yourself again. You've found your identity. Mm -hmm. You've found your purpose. Yeah. Yep. And when I first got divorced, I actually bought myself a fake wedding ring because, you know, I'm so good looking. Guys are bothering me. Guys are bothering me. I'm, I'm kidding about the good looking, but um, but I don't oh, fuck for a sixty year old, and and it was really it was triggering to me. I did not want people sending me drinks at restaurants and talking to me at the grocery store because they saw I didn't have a ring on. So I bought myself a fake wedding ring, and I wore it around, and it was like my protection. And it was really interesting. One day, about a year in, all of a sudden, I was at a friend's house for a picnic. And I was like, you guys, where's my ring? And it had just fallen off. And I was like, that is the sign that I didn't need that protection anymore, right? <laughs> yeah. oh, I love it. I love it. Um, yeah. So are you, are you dating? No. Nope. No. Good on you. Good on you. No, I'm saying I, have, I have no interest. But, you know, never say never. I've been seeing someone for about 18 months and he's absolutely fabulous. So, you know, there that. are there are diamonds out there. You've just got to, you've just got to <laughs> sing out of the rubble. <laughs> <laughs> I probably have to leave my house to find him, huh? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> well, because I, I was thinking the next businesses that we should set up as dating agencies. That's what I thought. There you go. Such a captive audience, you see. Right. Yeah. Matching up divorced people with the right other divorced people so their wounds don't trigger each other. I don't know how we do that. Yeah, we've done it. <laughs> intensive, a whole lot of intensive um, coaching with them, though, you know. Right. <laughs> like a, a matchmaking agency. That's right. That's for right. Divorced people. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so, something else no. that we could add to our repertoire between, between 1 a.m. and 3. Um, so, right. <laughs> So there's a question here, and a lot of people will be thinking about this potentially, as you do. I've just decided that I want a divorce. What's my next mm. step? Mm. What is my next step? Mm. Call a divorce coach. Exactly. <laughs> 0800 or what do we call from your prefix? Uh, I'm unsure. 
You know, the what? free cool from the US, I'm not sure what that is. Oh, free consult? Oh, no, no. There's a, we have an 0800, which is a free number you can ring with a few numbers oh. at the end. I wasn't yeah, sure what. 1 800 divorce coach. Yeah. Uh, there, yeah. <laughs> 911 divorce coach. Um, no, 911 is a major 911. Yeah. 911 <laughs> divorce coach. Um, you know, all joking aside, mm -hmm. that is my favorite time to work with people. I think it is the time we can have the most impact. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it is the time. I would say the majority of time people are 95% sure they want to get divorced. And this is not anything you want to be having a convert. You don't have that conversation with your spouse. You don't make that announcement until it is final and you're not going back. And you've you seen don't us. Tell your kids yeah. until it's final and you're not going back. So mm -hmm. if they're 95% sure I've been thinking about divorce, I'm pretty sure it's what I want to do. That's some work for us to do. Yeah. To yeah. make sure they understand all the implications. They're comfortable. They're confident with that decision. Because that's a that's a no go back once you drop the D bomb. Oh, absolutely. And you know, we have that which you do as well, um, when people are on the fence in terms of whether they should stay or go. But inevitably by the time they get to us, they really mm -hmm. are in that mode of, you know, I'm wanting to move on. You know, so right. Right. It is, and I, and you you and you'll be the same. And I say to clients, you've got to leave no stone unturned before you decide to leave. It's such a huge decision. And mm -hmm. we have clients that may span over two or three years. You know, yeah. with, with getting to that point of being able to go, okay, I'm ready to leave. We've worked on the relationship. We've we've got no regrets because we've tried tried hard. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, I deal with a lot of betrayal trauma victims. And so even though they've been betrayed in some of the most unimaginable ways, just horrific, there's something about women are saints and they still often want to give him a chance to change. So I call what we do parallel paths. Mm -hmm. So we identify what is it you're waiting for him to change while you're giving your marriage a chance, but at the same time, we're gonna take steps to prepare for divorce. Yeah. Right, so what are you watching for? I call that waiting with intention. Yeah. You can wait, wait, but what are you waiting for? Yeah. You're not helpless, long? you're not helpless. Mm. You're waiting for something. Mm. But get mm. prepared for divorce at the same time so that if mm. there's a day if the thing happens and you want to take dinner out of the oven, you're good. Yep. Whether that's six months or six years before you leave. Uh, absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Right. You'll you'll know what you're stepping into. And mm. then you don't have fear. And mm. fear escalates conflict. Mm. Fear makes us do, right? I always say divorce makes smart people do stupid things and stupid people go to jail. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I was going to say something, but it's popped out of my head. Um, so there's so many mistakes that people make in separation, and I'm guilty of making many of them. Um, and from your perspective, what's two of the biggest mistakes that people can make during this process? Two of the biggest mistakes, I think, are... definitely responding emotionally. So that reactive kind of language instead of responding strategically, right? So when I'm prepping clients for mediation, I say to them, look, you can go in that room and you can prove he's a jerk or you can improve the chances of getting what you want. So you can go in and vomit all over the table and, and talk about all the bad things he did. And, or you can set yourself up for success by being strategic. So those emotional reactions that then cause the other partner to get defensive and trigger their response. I think that's probably one of the number one things that I see. Um, and then yeah. trying to get away with sneaky stuff. Don't hide money. Don't hide money. 
don't keep your kids from that other parent. Like, mm. don't do the things you know you're not allowed to do. Yeah, yeah. And it's very difficult if, you, if you're not able to manage your emotions. So for me, yeah. definitely coming back to the, it's what you, you need to know what you own and owe if you're married, if you're de facto, if you're an independent person. Yeah. That is crucial for everyone. Yeah. Um, and the other things that really important because I see so much of this, it's happened in my own scenario. Um, I've been guilty of it before and I put my hand up in the early years and that's disparaging your ex to your children, you know. Um, mm. It's um, really, it's a no-go. And I learned very quickly yeah. because you're resentful. You know, you become very resentful, not able sure, to manage of course. It. And mm -hmm. I learned that way in that. And, um, mm -hmm. and you want to have no regrets in terms of the way that you're acted. And also right. it's really important that you don't rely on your children to support you through the yes. process. It's got to be the other way around, is not it? Got to be the other way around, right? And, there, and there's a way to speak truth about mm -hmm. your ex, speak truth about their dad that's not, or their mom. That's not disparaging, yeah. right? I'm not saying we have to spackle over and pretend nothing ever happened. Mm. Mm. I'm a fan mm. of truth. I'm a fan yeah. of truth in an age-appropriate way. Yeah. Not, we don't have to pretend there's a big old halo hanging there, but disparaging is a different thing. And, and it's coming back to what we talked about before is, is having a, a cupboard, so to speak, of the positives, you know, mm -hmm. positives of your ex, you've got these, if, if it's relevant, you've got children, you've got these beautiful children that have come from that relationship. There is definitely positives about them because as you and I know, it takes two people to tango in a relationship. There's not one person is, is not, um, it's always not one person's fault, you know. I might beg to differ with you there. Because what I will say is two imperfect people can stay married. We all make mistakes. But mm. I think there is sometimes some deal-breaking behavior that ends the marriage that is solely perpetrated by one party. Mm. Mm. I, mean, and I, had a client, I had a client, Bridget, whose husband spent $250,000 of their kid's college account on prostitutes. Wow. That's not a two-to-tango situation. No. That's no. a you're an hole and I'm done mm, I can't mm. believe you did that so mm. I you know now were they both imperfect did she sometimes burn the toast did she sometimes raise her voice when he didn't take the trash out mm. that's normal human conflict mm. that's normal interpersonal conflict mm. and people stay married through that all the time mm. what he did was deal breaker behavior he mm. ended the marriage with that choice mm. And that comes back to two, um, and you will work with a lot of individuals in this space, and that's um, high conflict personalities. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and we're not here to diagnose anybody because we are not therapists, psychologists. Mm -hmm. We're not your lawyer. You know, we're not your financial advisor. Um, but um, high conflict personalities are, you know, very difficult to navigate a journey, that sort of journey. And mm -hmm. I see a lot of individuals going through that process and being able to give them the tools yeah. uh, utilised through that journey is um, life-changing for them. Yeah, It is. It is. And, and because of our experience, some of what we can do is help them predict yeah. what might happen next, right? Cause, because we have some of the pages of the playbook Mm. Oh, that's, yeah, I think you're coming up on page 42. Here's what we might want to expect. Yeah. So let's get prepared for the smear campaign. Let's get prepared for how you're going to respond to this. Um, but yeah, I mean, we hear narcissist and sociopath and psychopath, and we hear all these labels. And, you know, what I say, it doesn't matter what flavor of jerk he is. Mm. What matters is understanding how he's going to react and how you're going to strategize. Yeah. That's all that matters. Yeah. It doesn't matter what yeah. a psychologist would say about him, her. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And, um, you know, for example, um, many make the mistake of you have to communicate to every single text and every single email communication and uh, across any platform. And, you know, as you and I know, 
um, high conflict personalities like attention, whether that's good, bad, or indifferent, they want attention. So that disengaging is um, just one aspect of it that's um, really important when you're moving through mm -hmm. this um, separation. Well, we have chatted away for 50 minutes. We have minutes. chatted away. I know. I was like, I thought we were going to do this for like 20 minutes, Bridget. And that's how much Bridget and I like each other and yep. how much fun we have. And, I know. You know. And, and we've got to do it more often, I think. We've got so much to offer um, in terms of... Um, you know, and I'll be on time school. next time, and I'll wear, I'll wear, I'll brush my hair. <laughs> well, you look. <laughs> well, that's, been, um, that's been really fantastic, um, Deborah. We're going to now. Her and I are going to get on and now do a, a, a brilliant podcast, which that'll probably be two hours long by the time we never went. know. She's going to keep me up <laughs> past my bedtime. Oh no, we're going to we'll do it because it must be nine o'clock. Must be eight o'clock. Eight o'clock. Yeah, eight o'clock. Yeah, because that's what time I thought we were doing this. So whatever. No, my Facebook post was wrong. My Instagram post was wrong. Oh, well. <laughs> that's, that's, I'm okay oh, sure. with imperfection, actually. Can, yeah, exactly. You know? um, and that, that's, that's, that's one of the things we have to get used to in divorce, too, is uncertainty and imperfection. And okay. it's okay to not be okay. You know, okay. it's okay to not be okay. I'm not okay a lot. And I'm good with it. <laughs> I hear you. Um, yeah. So... To, to more information about the lovely Deborah, um, Deborah Doak, uh, D E B R A, we'll, we'll put all this information down on, on the um, live anyway, D O A K dot com to find out more about her. We are um, equalexes.com, exes with an E X E S dot com, and equal before that. Um, we would be delighted to take any questions that anyone has or uh, yeah, get in contact with us. We can help, yeah. you know, what, um, but at the end of the day, we want you to have a fantastic new beginning. We want you to divorce well, separate with dignity, and, you know, there is life after divorce in such a positive Absolutely. way. So, so um, thank you, thank you thank very you. much. And we'll definitely have you on again soon because thank so many you. people have been watching and listening for such a long time, I see here, which That's is... Great. Um, which is absolutely brilliant. So thank yeah. you, everyone, for joining us. minutes. It feels like 20 seconds. So <laughs> I really, I enjoyed it. I know. Same. Absolutely. So thank you, everyone, okay. for joining us. And we will be back soon. We will let you know okay. when. Bye. Okay. Bye.